Thanks for joining me on the show today. My guest is a local community member and my friend, Megan Kovanen. And uh, she recently experienced a health crisis. Uh, it's been a year now, right, Megan? Yes. And I wanted to have you on here to share your perspective a year out of this, as well as the lessons you've learned and the people in our community who extended their help and support to you and your family. So thank you for being here. Thank uh, you. Yeah, you, I am, am, I'm not in your inner circle, but we've been friends for quite a long time through our uh, common associations. And I've been watching from the outside and definitely heard the news when you were diagnosed with your brain tumor. And, you know, we've, I, we've been in touch through text, but not one of the people who knew everything that was happening as it was happening for sure. So I just wanted you to kind of go back to the beginning for us. You were someone who felt seemingly healthy one day, which often happens in a health crisis. Mm -hmm. We, we don't think we're having symptoms, but maybe we were once we realized something's wrong. And then the very next day you were quite ill and needing to see a doctor. So if you can just back it up for us to that point, we can help share your story. Absolutely. Well, as you stated, you know, going on through life, raising boys, being a community member, um, being active and doing all of those things that one does. And, um, suddenly started to feel, you know, sick, high fever, kind of chills, not feeling well, generally, and um, came home from work. Then the next evening, um, you know, went to bed early. My husband um, was kind enough to switch places with me. I was supposed to take my son and another baseball buddy to a showcase over in Pullman um, for baseball, and I couldn't do it. And so switched gears. He headed over with the boys and started to feel worse and worse. And I was laying on the sofa thinking, I need help. And my youngest son, of course, was downstairs asleep. And in that moment, a dear friend of mine, um, Jane, sent me a note and said, sweet girl, do you need to go to the doctor? I am the friend that you have that will never ask for help um, and never raise my hand if, if something is kind of askew. And so I felt that was kind of a God wink <laughs> and said, yes. And she lives um, on the way up to the ski resort. And she was at my home in Sunny Slope in a record amount of time. <laughs> um, she loaded me up, took me to the, um, to the walk-in clinic. Cause I thought self-diagnosed, of course, that I was dehydrated. So Which doctors don't like for us to do. So they just like that. Yes. And <laughs> come to find out I was not right. Way off the so, mark. Yeah. <laughs> a little skosh. So um the wonderful walk-in people were very kind. They said, you know, we don't do IVs, so you're gonna need to go to the emergency department. So I walked over incredibly close. Everyone was wonderful. I uh, walked over and they started running every test, hooked me up to IVs, um, did a CAT scan. I mean, they did everything under the sun. And we're so incredibly thorough. And um, of course, again, my husband's out of town. I have a and dear have friend. Have you said anything to him? And you have your young son at home. Did you have someone come help with him? What, you know, what now oh, your day is moving and you've got kids yeah. and you've got, did you let Absolutely. your husband know? Absolutely. So let him know that I was heading to the doctor. Um, and at this point, my mom, then my dear friend called my mom and my mom was headed over from Spokane to be with my youngest. Um and neighbors. I mean, I am so fortunate to have the people in my life that I do. Um, and I think it's all by design. <laughs> so um, at this point, the I've got an incredibly high fever. Um, you know, all of those. Do you have a headache? Uh, yeah, I thought it was from the fever. Um, and in the evening. Um, and this is during COVID too. And one of the symptoms is a fever and a yeah, headache. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, was not COVID. <laughs> that was one of the tests that came back negative. So Dr. Cowgill walks in and um, she was amazing. She has since retired and said, you know what, you, we're going to admit you to the hospital. You're incredibly sick. You have sepsis. We have no idea what's causing it. Come to find out the brain tumor wasn't causing it either. They still have no so idea. Sepsis for people who don't know yeah. what that is. It's a systemic inf infection that can cause your organs to shut down and it's life-threatening. It's very serious. Usually there's a source that they can figure out. Um, but in your case, no. Oh, uh -uh. Not at all. Um, I think that's God wink number two of the day. <laughs> um, they then admit me to Central Washington Hospital. 
Um, and the beautiful thing about this community is the size and the people. And um, the individual who was rooming me was a dear friend, uh, the hospitalist on, on duty. Um, and she reached kind of over and said, you know, how are you doing? And I typically would say nothing about the fact that I had a headache thinking that it was, um, you know, the so high you fever. You had to mention it as a symptom. You had a well. CT of, of your abdomen, but not yeah. of your head. Yeah, exactly. And so at that point she said, you know, did they do a CT or a CT scan of your, of your head? And I said, no, they did one of my tummy, but not of my head, but my head feels like it I mean, I have a horrible headache. It hurts so badly. And she then said, well, let's, let's order that. And so off I went, um, came back to my room. It's late evening at this point. And she pulled up a chair and sat down and said that they found a mass. And as soon as she pulled up the chair and sat down, I thought, oh, here we go. And, and I you've think been through, that, your father um, had cancer years ago, many he did. years ago. So cancer was not foreign to you. No. And many times when we hear tumor, we assume cancer. Right. Uh, you know, and that's the, the, that's the scary prognosis of having mm -hmm. brain cancer. But, sure. you know, what at that point, so you, you get that information and are, are you, are you alone? Is anyone with you? Is your mom with you? No, you? I am alone at this point uh, due to um, the hour of, you know, the, the fact that it was, after visiting hours, it was late night. Um, it was during COVID, so you had limited access. You had one individual that could visit with you um, for the entire duration. So my mom was with my youngest son. There's nothing that she could do for me that night. By the time I was um, admitted to the hospital, it was maybe 8, 8.40 p.m., maybe almost 9. Um, by the time I found out that there was a mass on the brain, then it was even later. Um, Okay. And so uh, Dr. Shamborg th said, then said, you know, you have a late, uh, a long night ahead of you and we're going to order an MRI and, and get to the bottom of this. And I said, okay. And I felt calm. I wasn't incredibly afraid. I'm sure that's, you know, your body is in shock and right. trying to process this because by golly, wasn't, I only dehydrated was right. what I was still sticking to. Yeah. So, um, went and had my MRI and she said, you know, she was very candid and said, you know, you'll find out the information in the morning when the um, hospitalist comes in the morning and um, went and had an MRI and got back down and went to sleep, thank goodness. And then the next morning, the hospitalist came in, uh, Dr. Barry and said, you know, they, they did find a, a tumor on your brain. Um, and again, I was alone at this point. Um, and the neurosurgeon would be in in the morning to speak with me. So I knew my mom was coming in the morning and I had to make sure that I spoke with her before. And I just was making deals with God that, you know, please let my mom get here before the, um, before the neurosurgeon and please let her, or please don't let him come in until I tell her. So I told her what was going on. Um, and then I had to make a phone call to my dear friend whose son was in Pullman to ask her if she would go switch out with my husband. And then I called my sweet husband and had to share with him. And you asked him not to tell the children at that point. You're just you know trying what? to get, you, you still need to know, you, you just need to I process knew. it, right? You hadn't even been in the same room with your husband yet. No, uh -uh. no. And um, I didn't know what I was dealing with. And no, I Jack get that. I you know, that. I wanted him to be able to experience his weekend and well, there'd be <sighs> nothing he could do for you. No, it would have yeah, served. I, I agree no. with that decision that we yeah. protect our kids from whatever we can. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the things too, and we'll take a break here and come back and, and finish this part of the, of your story. But one of the things too, that I think is important to mention is like this, this step-by-step -step process of you getting this information. And like you said, you're in a bit of shock. Um, you still, you don't know yet if you have cancer, you know, now that you're going to have to have some type of brain surgery and, um, is it operable? Is it inoperable? Is it going to be easy to get to? It's a lot to process. So, uh, let's take a break and when we come back, we'll finish up this part. And I just wanted to also reflect on 
you know, what you're learning from this and share a bit about your father's experience. So we'll be back in just a moment. Hi, we're back talking with Megan Coven. And at this point now you've shared with us that you uh, know that you have a brain tumor that's confirmed. Your husband's on his way back from WSU with your older son, your mom's with your younger son. You're getting all of this information. It's a lot to process. And ultimately you did find out that you had a brain tumor and they wouldn't know until they went in for surgery, you know, it's exact location in terms of any risk. And then also um, if it was cancer or not. So how long after you found out about the tumor, did you have surgery? And I know you opted to stay here at home. And some people were like, should you maybe go to Seattle? I mean, this is brain surgery, nothing against Wenatchee whatsoever, but you know, it's brain surgery. So, um, and you, you were pretty steadfast in your decision to stay. So t- tell us about that decision-making and just what that month was like waiting. Absolutely. Well, you know, going back a little bit, they knew exactly where it was located due to the MRI. Mm-hmm. Um, but whether it's cancerous or not, they wouldn't know until they got in and, and did the surgery. I, um, my they mom know then also is in a place they could get it all. Or is that something they felt they would... incredibly confident? Okay. Good. Doctor was, so you knew that early on. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing is the bulk of my family is from the West side. Um, and cousins and even my mom were like, you know, darling, I think you should come West, (laughs) come to the coast and get your surgery. Um, and you know, we had an incredible experience with my father at Virginia Mason, um, Seattle cancer care Alliance was just so incredible to so many other family members. And, and he was a um, longtime cancer survivor. He was absolutely quite a warrior. Yeah. A great, how many years, uh, he survived 25 years. And what would you say at this point, are you gleaning from your experience, observing him and your own experience now? Uh, Absolutely. And every day since. (laughs) Yes. Absolutely. You know, I think, um, I think I shared this story with you before. Um, He was in the hospital and father McGuire, who has since passed, asked him, are you afraid to die? And he said, no, he said, absolutely not. I have lived my life with no regrets and he leans as I do, I think into faith and, and faith means different things for different people. And he was a gift and he was a force and he was an impact. And, um, he lived each day with grace. And if he fell, he fell forward and, um, he was a gift. You know, one had- of the things how I really came to know you better is after you gave a talk at uh, a wellness place event mm-hmm. and which is a local cancer organization here where we live founded by a retired oncology physician, Dr. Carl, Carl Kobeck. And, um, he was an oncologist, right? He was, a he yes, that's right. And, um, and so you had encounters with people through your volunteer work. And then you gave this very beautiful speech about your father. I was really quite moved by it. I remember going to your table. I didn't know you well um, Mm -hmm. at that point, but it had been a long time since I had thought about cancer as it applied to me. Now, every year during my checkup and all that, if you know me well, you know that those, you know, I do really well about 362 days of the year. And then those three or so days during the testing, it's, it's just no fun. You never get used to it. Uh, 26 years myself. So I'm very happy for that. Uh, But yes, yay. Uh, But you moved me in a way because whatever you shared at that time, it felt like you were speaking to me. And I'm sure a lot of people in the room felt that way. That's why we all stood up and clapped for you. Uh, And so the lessons from him obviously carry over into now what could be your own cancer experience, but for sure a medical crisis, no matter how you look at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So now you had the surgery, um, you found out that it wasn't cancer. Um, I was part of some text thread that I was able to get that news as well that, that day. And, um, everyone rejoiced. What was the first thing that came to your mind when you got the news that it wasn't cancer and that they got all of the tumor? Uh, when I, when I was coherent enough, (laughs) I was like, let's get this going. Let's let's get onto the road to recovery. Let's, you know, I've got 
weddings to dance at and boys to raise and baseball to watch. And yeah, that's a good friends point. to love on. So I was just wanting to get, get the phase passed get on with it. Uh, on. One of the things that you talked about, you and I talked about off camera was uh, a term that you s- used called toxic positivity. Oh yeah. And so you're a positive person in general. I am as yeah. well. Try glass half full. Don't borrow trouble. Try not to worry about things. Try, try. Um, so y- you had said something about like, some people don't really take well to that whole positivity thing. They think it's, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. But you were looking at it very differently from that. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think fine might be a four letter word. (laughs) (laughs) Starts with an F. (laughs) Right. I think that there is, um, unless you walk through something, you don't know, and you don't know what an individual needs to get through it. So for me, I don't care if it's brain tumor or, um, you know, back in the day doing an exam with school, I have to be laser focused that the outcome is going to be good, Mm -hmm. that I'm going to do everything within my power to make that outcome a positive one. And whatever that turns out to be, I don't quite know, but I'm going to do everything in my power to make, to make it go well either for those around me, like my family members or myself. And I don't want to look back on the journey and think, well, well I tanked that because it has a bigger impact on right. people. It does. And-, and I think in, especially in a health crisis, you want to be part of the decision-making. You want to build a team of trusted providers, and then you want to comply with the decision that you help make. Absolutely. And so now you're all signed up for it and it turns out really well for you. And so now you have a whole other level of positivity because yeah. you come through this and you were talking about how people don't really know how to respond and what to say and how to navigate that. So let's take a break. When we come back, I just want to share some of the insight that you and I have both experienced in, in being a patient and being a caregiver or being the loved one of someone who's going through something really hard. So let's take a break. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, we're back talking with Megan Covenin, and you have been um, very transparent in sharing your story, um, experiencing a brain tumor. Let's add that you had your one year anniversary about a month ago. All scans were clear. You'll get checked every year. I know it's a little stressful, but all good for this year. All good for this year. Yes. Okay. We were talking a little bit about how people don't necessarily know how to respond or what to say. And um, one of the things that I've, I've, people reach out to me pretty often when there's a loved one who's been sick or how to navigate that, what to do, how to help. And really, if you're good at casseroles, make casseroles. And if you're good with words, send a card, you know, there really are no mistakes when you're doing something from love. Mm -hmm. So if your intentions are good, it will be received that way. And, you know, that's, that's always my advice. And so you had a lot of people um, helping you and making meals and doing all these things that, that really help sustain your family and, you know, the, the rhythm of your household, because not only had you had major surgery, but your brain has to heal. Mm-hmm. And that's a different kind of recovery. Absolutely. I think, um, my dad used to say, you can never say the wrong thing to the right person. And it's so true. And, um, I had friends that would just kind of come sit on the sofa and just be present. Um, I had friends that would just send a little text and Dan would read it to me or um, cards. And I think you really can't say the wrong thing to the right person. And if you ever have um, a moment where you're like, well, should I call? Should I send a text? Should I, will I be, I don't want to intrude. Um, Ask someone, if you're not in that tight, tight inner circle, ask somebody who is and say, Hey, I was thinking about, you know, that's what I did with you. That's what I did with you. (laughs) Yeah. I just said, do you think it'd be okay if I sent a message? And our friend said, of course, sure. Of course. And, and also I'm a big believer. Let's just say you aren't going through a medical crisis. I'm a big believer. If I wake up with someone heavy on my heart, I reach out and I say, hello, or I say, how are you? Or I say, good morning, just something or whatever time of day it is. Yes. And I'm usually, I mean, I'm, I'm never, I'm never steered wrong by doing that, but sometimes I find that they were in need of something that that mm-hmm. message, just like your friend messaging you that morning, do you need to go to the doctor? You know, it that is- was something that was an intervention that was completely unexpected. Absolutely. I think that, you know, you hit the nail on the head that it's that connection. 
it's the um, simply reaching out, making those connections that can make all the difference. And whether it's reaching out to say hello, or if it's putting a little flower on the doorstep and then scooting out so you're not, you know, staying or lingering, or the obligatory casserole, which I am so thankful for. I can't even tell you um, this community cared for my boys when I couldn't. It was a gift. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you like to say to the community uh, since so many of your friends and families will be watching this and just as a lesson to others who don't know you, but yeah. can glean, uh, you know, I always feel like it's a good thing when we can learn from other people's hardships because yeah. we may not go through that, that exact thing, but we learn empathy from that and how we can help others, you know, by the examples of the people who help show and are willing to tell their stories. <sighs> what would I say? I want to say everything. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for loving my family and loving me and getting me through this. And to be quite honest, um, it's, it's a long journey still, and it's still quite uncomfortable some days and some evenings. Um, it's hard to sometimes shut down my brain and the people are the silver lining and, you know, mishaps have happen, uh, ailments happen. And at the end of the day, it is the people and it's a gift. I was in Leavenworth, one of the first little outings that I had had, and I am sure I looked a sight and I had <laughs> my hat, <laughs> my, my walker. I looked like the little man from up I had my hat, my walker, my <laughs> mask, cause it's still COVID. And, um, a woman looked kind of familiar and I, smile, you know, raised my eyes like, hello. <laughs> and she put her hand on my forearm and my walker and said, I've been praying for you. And I was so kind of startled by it. Man, what a gift. Because you didn't even know her. No, to have this tribe, this amazing community of people who are praying for me, they don't know me, just to send me goodwill and then I get better. Holy cow. Mm -hmm. I've thought about that every day since. And every so often I'll scan a big crowd looking for her. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. You haven't seen her yet, but no, maybe you will. Yeah. You know, the other thing too, um, I, my father was the caregiver of my mother and she's done incredibly well. And I remember at the very beginning, we just have like a minute left, but I remember at the very beginning saying to my dad, you know, I, I can't do this for you. This is your sickness and in health. This is your for better, for worse. I've already lived through it. Uh, with my late husband, but uh, I can teach you everything I know. And my parents most definitely can now navigate their healthcare with very little help from me unless they ask for it. But what do you think? I mean, gosh, you have a minute to tell me, but um, what do you <laughs> think you've learned in your marriage? Because we stand up and take those vows, but we don't necessarily, we're not confronted with them early in our marriage, maybe, or later in our marriage, but you were confronted with that for better, for worse, sickness and health. Absolutely. Um, gosh, I've known, I've had Danny Coven in, in my life longer than I have not. And um, I learned that when the tough, the tough presents itself, he, he stands up tall mm -hmm. and puts the rest of us on his shoulder. So gives us a good view. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good way to look at it. Well, I'm so glad you're here. I'm thanks for sharing your story. I know you're going to continue to do beautifully well. And I'm glad that we had the opportunity to share it here in our community. And yeah, I just wish you continued wonderful health. I so appreciate you. Can I say one more thing? Sure. You got 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, go. Um, I also want to thank the people who took care of me at Confluence because I got to stay home and heal at home. And I think that that is why I was able to kind of progress so quickly and, and do so well. I didn't have to travel back and forth or be without my family. Yeah, so with your family. I'm thankful for the community and I'm thankful for you and giving us a voice. Mm -hmm.